This Week in Startups is brought to you by Capterra. Find the software that will help you do what you do better. Join the millions of people who use Capterra every month. To start your search today, visit capterra.com slash twist. And Wonder Capital, an award-winning platform to invest in solar energy projects across the U.S. Earn up to 8.5% annually while diversifying your portfolio, curbing pollution, and combating global climate change. Create your free account at wondercapital.com slash twist. Next up is Patrick from Stripe. Please welcome Patrick. Come on out. How many people here have used Stripe? Raise your hand really high if you've used Stripe. Oh my God. I, oh wait, hold on. In your product or not as a customer, but in your product, raise your hand really high. Oh my God, this is your audience. So should I come out or do you want to get some candid feedback? No, get over. I, Good right. to see you. Give me it up top because I'm just getting over a cold. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Um, you've got uh, a brand new product. That's right. Uh, and we're going to show a video, but I wanted to start just maybe giving people a little context and the history of the company. What's the footprint of Stripe today? Um, so uh, we're, we don't disclose many metrics about the business, um, uh, but we say that we handle now billions of dollars uh, of sort of aggregate revenue every year for sort of all of the, the companies building on the platform. Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we've many thousands of companies uh, uh, building on top of it, but we, we, don't, we don't disclose the, the exact figures. Uh, w w one thing that's now the case because of Atlas, this project you just mentioned, um, that I think is, is, is super cool, is we, we, we now work with companies in about 124 countries. And so basically wow. we now work with companies in, uh, in just most countries. Um, How uh, many people work at the firm, generally uh, speaking? We're, we're about to hit 700. 700? That's right. And when did you start? And how did this all uh, start? Right. So. Um, you know, you know I, th I think there's a kind of broader phenomenon across the industry of sort of things that, you know, and I'm sure many of you have sort of had this experience yourselves, where, where sort of things that you've been working on for a long time, you know, you, you, the world suddenly thinks you've hit this inflection point and considers you an overnight success. You're like, shit, you know, I've been working on this for a long time, right? And I think Stripe is, uh, is kind of a good example of this, where we wrote the first lines of code for Stripe in, uh, in October of 2009. Uh, so, so a long time ago, right? It's, you know, eight years this year. Um, we, we launched it publicly in, uh, in September 2011. Um, uh, but you know, there was, there was almost two years of us, of us just writing code you know, by ourselves or you know, uh, over time with sort of a, a small group of people. Um, uh, and so you know, depending on how you count, we're you know, somewhere five, six you know, years again uh, 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 post-launch. Um, uh, but you know, for, for, from our standpoint, the, we've, we've been working on this for, for quite a while now instead of laying the, the, the foundations. And with things, again, like Atlas, which I, I guess we'll get to in a second, we've been sort of thinking about doing things like this for, again, you know, soon it'll be for a decade, but sort of we're now reaching the scope and scale where we can kind of really go and execute on some of them. What so, was that pain point that made you start the company? What, I yep. mean, I remember at that time, uh, PayPal was just horrific to deal with. Like every time I tried to get into my account, it didn't work. Yep. Every time we tried to accept money from people, it didn't work. And right. then they would, everybody would tell me the same thing. Yep. I, do you have a PayPal account? I have one. Oh, can, can I see? Oh, it's locked. Right. And I can't get anybody on the customer support line. And I have $2,000 in there, but I can't get into my, anybody have customer support problems with PayPal? Raise your hand. <laughs> It's a whole lot of just raise your hand. There was just like this very, they seem to have figured it out since, but there was this very dark period where yes. nobody was running PayPal. Right. Was that what led you to have that opportunity to zip in there? Well, um, look, I don't want to speak ill of any particular That's company. That's my job. But, but, yeah, and, uh, we, we heard from our friends yeah. and from people around us building companies and so on that some of the companies they worked with were um, occasionally suboptimal. Um, uh, but, but, you know, it, it's easy to kind of focus on PayPal. And I think that's actually, um, uh, you know, obviously they're... they're pretty large and established and so on, but it, it certainly was not just them. And that sort of when we looked to just our friends, people we knew running companies and so on, and mo most of them actually weren't building on PayPal, maybe in, perhaps in part for, for those reasons or others, or I don't know, but mo most of them weren't. Most of them were building on these legacy players, like they were working with banks, they were working with gateways, processors, sort of stuff like this, right? And, and they were sort of looking to, you know, to buy sort of essentially a technology service from them, right? I mean, they wanted APIs for sort of turning credit card numbers or whatever the payment instrument was into money in their bank account, right? That, that's kind of the service they were looking to buy. But, you know, the, these companies, which were, again, providing an AWS-like service in terms of the core nature of it, you know, they were not equipped to be AWS. They were not equipped to sort of provide flexible APIs or to, you know, to, to, to enable people to really iterate quickly with their software. And then the big structural thing, um, and I think a large part of sort of what's enabled Stripe's rise, is that 
that they were, they were very kind of geographically balkanized, right? There was one bank in the US, and they worked with a different bank in the UK, and a different bank you know, in continental Europe, and so on. And so that, you know, from, the, from a company standpoint, you, have, of course, want to serve you know, as, as large an audience as possible, right? But the need then to go sort of market by market and country by country and sort of financial institution by financial institution, I mean, that, that's just like a, a, you know, a massive and in most cases untenable pain in the ass, right? Yeah. Uh, which then meant that people kind of weren't serving markets they should be. And so a large part of, I think, what enables Stripe, back to your question, uh, is that we're building kind of this universal global platform for you know, building an online business, right? And that they're, they're, again, these financial institutions, they were huge, but they were focused on particular markets, uh, and that created a lot of the opportunity for us. When, when did you guys have the idea? Do you remember the moment where I, I actually do, and you know I think there's a lot of kind Take of false. Take me to it. Yeah, you know I think there's a lot of kind of false, you know, kind of um, uh, written, you know, post hoc Origin narratives stories. about it. exactly right, right. The PR um, group gets together in a room right, and they're like, and they're, "Tell me about your life." Okay, up, here's your origin story. Woke up one morning and just was dreaming about uh, you know economic infrastructure and the internet. But no, um, uh, <laughs> so uh, what, what what actually happened was uh, uh, John and I, John's my my um, my co-founder and also um, my brother, uh, we uh, we went to uh, startup school. Uh, back in, in October 2009. Um, at Y Combinator. Uh, 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 right, right. Are we allowed to talk about other startup conferences? Of course. Uh, all right, yeah. all right. Um, I it's sure. all one big so happy like family. on me from the, the stage. No, 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 okay. no. Um, uh, So we went to, went to yeah. startup school back in 2009. Um, and, uh, I talked about PayPal. I mean, it's... Uh, fair, yep. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, John and I were very inspired uh, and, and we were having dinner afterwards and we've been kind of... Uh, talking about an idea around this for a while, just because we'd sold some apps in the App Store and it had been incredibly easy, right? Uh, and, and we were generating enough revenue from those apps to, to help you know, pay, pay for our, 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 um, our college tuition bills at the time. Um, and we were kind of reflecting on how it was so easy to sell apps in the App Store and it was so monstrously difficult to just do anything involving kind of transactions or commerce or business on this sort of broader internet, right? And so we are kind of chatting about this idea. Um, and, uh, and then kind of walking home from dinner, and it was just, it was, it was over in Potrero, uh, I remember John kind of turning to me and, uh, you know, arguing that, well, we should just go build a prototype of this, you know, like, how, how hard can it be? Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how hard could it be to start of so, many, a billion dollar company? Uh, and so here, here we are, uh, you know, uh, again, soon it'll be a decade later, and uh, uh, John is who you should blame. But you raised a little bit of money. I know because Sequoia, back in the day, started something called Scouts. Uh, which was like a group of us, including Sam Altman, who Sam and I were both Sequoia founders, but they started the Scouts thing, and right. Roloff both was like, hey, can you guys put 25 or 50K into some companies? And I think the first time I heard about you was Sam was like, yeah, this company Stripe is going to make payments easier, and he put money into it. And huh. I was like, you should see this cab company. It's going to be Uber's going to change everything. <laughs> Those were the two it investors. Sounds like a good program, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so we... Um, well, we, we were in school at the time, uh, and so... Uh, yeah, talk we, about the funding, yeah, and yeah, how you yeah, met yeah. Sam. So, so we weren't kind of initially sure how seriously to take it. And, you know, I always love the story that... Um, uh, that uh, in, in sort of the famous house that Facebook started in, in Palo yeah. Alto, uh, that like Facebook was not the only company they were working on, right? There was also that 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 peer-to-peer -peer file sharing thing, right? Sure. But I, I mean, Facebook had, had sort of launched at Harvard at least in in I think February of '04, right? And so they're working um, in that house, you know, that subsequent summer. And just, I find it very interesting that sort of you know, call it six months later, it was kind of not obvious that like Facebook was the thing to be working on, right? Right. You're kind of pursuing multiple ideas in parallel, uh, and sort of similarly. Um, I, you know, with Stripe, even though, e even once we'd built this little prototype that, you know, we thought held some promise or whatever, it wasn't like obviously a great idea or anything, right? And we still had these apps in the App Store. They sort of um, uh, helped you store a copy of Wikipedia on your iPhone. We thought that had some kind of interesting opportunities. You know, what's the future of knowledge sharing or whatever, right? Um, wait, wait, so, so this was an app that... You could just read all of Wikipedia, like stored offline on your iPhone, the whole thing. Um, oh, very and, nice. so, and so you're on a plane, or you're in a different country, or you're on a mountain. So you just build um, that over a weekend, and like, this is cool. I actually built it when I was in Japan uh, back when um, you know the iPhone first came out, and um, uh, you know there was a, I didn't have a data plan or anything, and so I was just so frustrated with not having access to Wikipedia that you know, we just went and built the app. Um, but uh, but anyway, I guess you know the, the, the point being, we we didn't know if we should raise money for Stripe or not because were we I mean we we're in school, was, was this going to be a kind of a serious thing? And so what we actually went and did was we. Um, we came out to uh, to the Bay Area 
that again, that subsequent summer, um, uh, this was for us in the summer of 2010, and uh, just decided to kind of work on Stripe as our kind of bootstrapped internship, um, uh, sort of self-internship. Um, but you were smart uh, enough to come here for some reason. You just thought you'd get yeah, more. Yeah, well, especially for Stripe, you know, given that we were kind of our, our, our target audience was, was other startups, other entrepreneurs, other founders, and so on. Sort of being in the Bay Area felt, felt like you know a, a pretty obvious thing to do. Um, and, uh, and then over the course of that summer, basically, and, and again, I think there's kind of maybe a lesson here where, uh, you know, I think a lot of really good ideas really don't seem particularly great or big up front. Again, certainly speaking from personal experience, Stripe did not. But over the course of working on it that summer and sort of thinking about it and so on, uh, we, we kind of came to shift from sort of thinking about it you know, merely as this nice little tool for, for developers that kind of makes their lives easier uh, you know, initially, which is kind of what, uh, what we started out with, to kind of realizing that, well, when you sort of survey the broader landscape, it's not just that it sort of sucks for developers to have to sort of integrate payments initially into the, their website or service or whatever, but that like the whole edifice is broken, right? I mean, 2% at the time, 2% of all consumer spending took place on the internet. And it's like, why is it so low? Why is it so insanely difficult for any company to do anything that touches online transactions? When we went, we talked to a mid-sized company or a large company. It's like, you know, what's your experience of just like dealing with business and the internet, and they would, you know, they would spend half an hour telling us about sort of the markets they couldn't serve and their fraud challenges and the things they couldn't integrate and just, you know, we came to appreciate that sort of what we thought was kind of a, you know, this, this little pond was actually kind of this much larger ocean. And so we see that summer we kind of made two decisions um, to, to drop out of school or, you know, as our, our, our mom continues to prefer we call it, to take, uh, you know, a leave of absence. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, then, and then secondly, we had to go, you know, raise some initial money from, uh, from Sam Altman um, and, and Peter Thiel and, and Sequoia and a couple of others. Hey, if you're a small or medium-sized business, even a large one, you're trying to find solutions to solve your problems, right? Wouldn't it be great if there was like a directory or a marketplace where all these great web services were found? Well, that service now exists. It's called Capterra, C-A-P-T-E. R-R-A, Capterra. And they help you find the software solution that your business needs right now. You can just go to capterra.com slash twist. And whether you need website building or customer service, project management, maybe you want to track applications and uh, do email marketing, it's so easy to use. You'll find 400 different categories of software to choose from with thousands of ratings and reviews from actually people who've used this software. You get to you know, have that experience where before you go to the restaurant, you can hear what other people did. Well, this is just like those services. Before you use the software, you can hear what other people who've actually used the software think. Millions of people are using Capterra every month, and it's free. That's the best part about it. There's no obligation. You don't even need to register. It's a free resource that will help you make the right decision when evaluating software. And you want to make the right decision because everybody knows it's a little bit of an investment, right? In which one of these software programs do you pick? There's cost involved. There's onboarding time involved. There's training you want to pick the right one, and Capterra will help you pick the right software to grow your company. Find the right software to help you do what you do better. Capterra.com slash twist. Capterra.com slash twist. Welcome to the program, Capterra. Everybody follow Capterra on Twitter, and if you're a super fan, you know what to do. Say thank you at Capterra on your Twitter handle and let them know that you love them for supporting independent media like This Week in Startups, where we all learn so much every week, twice a week, 100 plus episodes a year. We're all learning so much here, thanks to people like Capterra that support independent media like This Week in Startups. Okay, speaking of which, let's get back to this amazing program. So I knew that this was going to be ridiculously huge when I asked what ticket software we're going to use this year, because we always have this painful experience of using other platforms. They take all of our money. The service isn't great. And a couple of years ago, somebody said, oh, um, well, we just built our own. And I said, how did you build your own? And they said, well, you know, we're using this new thing, Typeform, which, yeah. which lets you fill out forms like SurveyMonkey or whatever. Yep. And it's really beautiful. Uh, and it's out of Spain. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then we just put our Stripe stuff in, and, and we're just doing it ourselves. And yeah. I said, wow, the world has changed. The entire value, and this was non-technical people. This is like, you know, operations people. Yep. Um, no, set up their own ticketing company. 
Yeah, so, okay, so there's two aspects of that story that I like, which you know, I haven't heard before, but sort of first, the fact that they're based in Spain, right? Uh, and yeah. that sort of so much of the, the, the kind of potential of the internet is that, you know, the internet does not care uh, sort of, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, about the sort of national borders of the atoms that you're sitting on top of, right? You, you know, and, and you should be able to build, you know, something like Typeform in Spain or in, you know, Nicaragua or, or Indonesia or sort of wherever you happen to be, right? Uh, but but, but that sort of that's been impeded for so long by, I think, needless barriers. And then, yeah, secondly, I think that sort of, I mean, again, the, the, the whole you know, uh, point of the internet is that sort of one can sort of create such amazing leverage from sort of when, once you get the right tool, right? I think it sometimes takes a while to discover what the right tool is. Uh, you know, again, uh, uh, sort of virtualized servers uh, and AWS and now kind of uh, GCP and, and so on being kind of good examples of this, right? But when you get, when you finally get the right tool and you figure out the right abstraction, you go sort of enable people in the right way, you get... Push. Uh, and I think that sort of people have underestimated that for a long time. And I mean, people, again, when we had Stripe prototypes early on and we sort of showed investors, I mean, some of them, fortunately for us, you know, we managed to raise some money, some of them were like, some of them kind of got it. But a lot of people are like, why would people want a payments API? Um, when for you did it become clear that this was going to be huge? Every entrepreneur has like some personal moment where they sort of walk out of the office yep. and go, yes, or they just can't sleep because, my God, it's so clear that this could be huge. Yeah. Um, when did you have that first moment where you're staring at the ceiling and going, my God, we, we got something here? You know, uh, w the... the, the the first such moment was probably pretty early, right? Uh, maybe a month after we started working on something, we were like, you know, God, this will take over the world. But of course, then that was, you know, succeeded by a, an event, you know, the, the next morning, where like, this is the worst idea in history. Like, I can't <laughs> believe we're wasting our time with it, uh, uh, and so on. And you know, it, it's it's pretty kind of sinusoidal, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, again, I think this is something that you know tends to get lost over in in the histories and the the, the public narratives and so on, right? But like, fr from my personal vantage point, again, there were absolutely moments, many of them. Kind of early on, where I, you know, I thought there was real potential here. I thought that you know we were willing to drop out of school. You know, I, I, I thought I thought that um, uh, this this could really become something. But for, kind of break for, your mother's for, heart. Uh, right, right. Uh, uh, for, for every for every such moment, yeah. there there was a sort of counterbalancing. Yeah. Like we're, we're we're you know two kids, and you know if we you know stand on top of each other and put a suit around both of us, we can kind of pretend to be, you know, an adult and like, you know, yeah. we've got to work with these banks and, uh, and like, I, I remember our first meeting with a bank, um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if she literally had like the security button under the table, but like, <laughs> I think if she had had one, she would have been pushing it. Um, and, uh, and she told us in, you know, no, no kind of, um, uh, you know, no uncertain terms that there was no possibility that, that they would work with us. Right. Uh, and so, uh, again, I, I guess because, you know, I, Subsequent to our launch, you know, we were fortunate where we, 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 we've had sort of a lot of traction and so on. Um, but kind of because of that, uh, I, I really, I guess, feel this imperative to emphasize the long period um, of sort of, you know, again, two years, it's a long time when you're in it, um, of, of working away with, with so many of these roadblocks and headwinds and people telling us that it couldn't work or shouldn't work was a bad idea. Um, uh, m mostly because I think that you know, for, for others, either here or elsewhere, for sort of having that experience. I mean, it could mean that you can't actually do it, or the idea is a bad idea, or, or whatever, right? Or, or it might not, right? And, and again, certainly in Stripe's case, um, uh, it, you know, uh, the fact that post hoc it turned out to you know, work, at least you know, so far, um, it, that still meant that we, um, uh, we, we, we had all of that questioning and all of those challenges in the early days. What was the darkest moment? Um, the, the moment where you're like, this is so, not so, going to so, work. So, yeah, so um, uh, there, there, there was a moment uh, very early on. Um, so, you know, n now sort of Stripe is replicated across, you know, multiple data centers and uh, invested kind of a huge amount in, in redundancy and, and, and availability and failover capacity and everything else, right? That was not the case, you know, four months in, call it. Uh, maybe it was a little bit more, maybe it was six months in. Um, and, so, so, you know, uh, six months in, you know, we still ourselves, of course, you know, took it very seriously, and the fact that sort of our customers were relying upon us uh, uh, for for the revenue was, um, you know, was a big deal for us, right? And so my pager went off at 4 a.m. one night, um, and you know, the, the the API was down. And and, and again, this this is not like a, a social media app or something, right? This this is the conduit for our customers' revenue, so it was a big deal. And so um, uh, I remember kind of immediately heading to the office. We lived, you know, very close to the office. I was at the office within five minutes, you know, 4:05 a.m. Uh, and started to kind of try to figure out, diagnose what was, what was going wrong. Um, 
and, uh, and it turned out that sort of an upstream switch at our data center had failed, um, and, uh, and you know, nominally they had redundancy and multiple internet connections, but it had been misconfigured, and so it was all down, and so we had multiple servers, but like the, the underlying uplink connection was broken, and, and so you know, upshot being API was down, and we couldn't do anything about it. Um, and it was amazingly painful, right, because you know, the, the thing is down, you sort of want to be kind of furiously typing, you know, fixing, getting it back up, whatever, and, and you just couldn't. Had to, you know, wait on hold, and, and we were getting these kind of forlorn updates from the data center every 15 minutes. That's kind of their progress in fixing it. Eventually, and, and you know, th this, this felt like one of the longest, you know, eight hour periods of my life. It was, it was almost literally eight hours. They sort of got a, a new switch, and they replaced it, and, and you know, the, 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 the whole thing came back up. But that's not why it was the darkest moment. Um, uh, the darkest moment, of course, was because I was bracing myself for the deluge in complaints and dissatisfied customers and anger and vitriol and everything else. And you know, 1 p.m. rolled around, and as far as I could tell, nobody had cared or noticed. Uh, wow, <laughs> dodged a bullet. Um, and, and you know, it kind of on some level, that was good news, but you know, as I reflected on it, I realized that it was actually kind of existentially bad news. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, I, you know I'd been up till very late the night before, maybe until one or two, and you know, I'd, I'd gotten very little sleep. And so I just remember walking home from the office to go catch a little bit of sleep um, after that, and uh, it, it, it was not a great day. Uh, it goes back to when uh, Airbnb would have problems in a city, or the Twitter fail well would happen, and it would all of us would be going crazy talking about it. Right. And it would seem to the people inside those companies like, oh my God, this is it. This is really a problem. For and sure. the next day, the number of user signups would triple or go 10x. Yep. Because people go, what's Airbnb and why was it banned in this city? <laughs> right. Can I have it in my city? Uh, for, for us, we didn't even get that subsequent surge. No, uh, so no bump? No, no silver no lining here. Yeah, yeah. It was um, uh, just, uh, there, there was again a, a, an extended period of, of the world, I think, being fairly. Um, yeah, um, uh, did not right. pay a lot of attention to our existence. Hey everybody, I am so, so excited to tell you about a new partner we have here at This Week in Startups. This is an amazing one. It's called Wonder Capital with a U, W-U-N-D-E-R Capital. And what they are doing is they're helping you combat global climate change, and make money at the same time. All right, here's how it works. They are an award-winning online investment platform that lets you invest in solar energy projects across these United States of America. And you can earn up to 8.5% annually. Do you know what your money's making right now in a savings account? Go take a look. It's not 8.5%. And this will diversify your portfolio and it will curb pollution and combat global climate change, which if you're listening to this program, you have a very high IQ, you're a very refined individual, and you know that global climate change is a real issue. If you're listening to This Week in Startups, you're obviously not a dummy. Your investment goes directly into helping US SMBs install solar panels. You know what SMBs are if you're listening to this program, small and medium-sized businesses. And those businesses will repay their loans to wonder with you, and you get monthly payments directed into your bank account, right? Direct deposit, right in there. Best of all, Wonder Capital takes no fees for investing your money. Kind of screwing it up for me. I, my, I take 20%, 25% of what my LPs give me. I get a carry, but Wonder Capital takes no fees. They offset the CO2 emissions from almost 3 million pounds of coal burned. How amazing is that? I'm so proud that they're a sponsor of this program. They're supporting independent media, and they're going to help you make up to 8.5% a year. This is what the true fans of This Week in Startups need to do right now. Go create a free account at wondercapital.com slash twist. Remember, that's with a U, W-U-N-D-E-R capital.com slash twist. And you can do well and do good at the same time. I've heard of triple uh, bottom line companies. This one feels like a quadruple bottom line company. Look at the U.S. small businesses here in the United States of America. We're going to make America great again. They're going to get loans for their solar you're going to get an 8.5% return. The planet is going to get saved. And hey, Wonder is probably going to do pretty well too. Quadruple bottom line capitalism from Wonder Capital. Wondercapital.com slash twist. And if you're a super fan of the show, say thank you at Wonder Capital for supporting at Jason and TWI Startups. Go ahead and do that on Twitter and I will like it and retweet it. All right, let's get back to this amazing program. So uh, I want to... Uh, play the video of this new product you have, and then afterwards you said you'd make the big IPO announcement. So let's, uh, your PR people right now just like totally spit their coffee out. They're like, oh my God, why did we agree to do this? Yeah, that, that, He's that's... not gonna announce anything in an IPO. Um, so uh, frame for us what we're gonna see in this video. 
Sure. Um, so, uh, so, so, so Atlas is a product that we sort of uh, first announced uh, back Great in uh, fe February of last year. Um, yeah, it, it uh, you know, uh, every, um, uh, well, we sort of went through this long period trying to find the right name for it, right? And we just like kept circling back to no, it, it, it really has to be Atlas. Um, but the oath was taken uh, and shrunk, <laughs> so you had to. Exactly. Um, uh, so um, the, you know, you know John and I grew up in Ireland uh, and, you know, didn't move to the U.S. Where, Dublin? Uh, or uh, no, in like the middle of the countryside. Where? Um, uh, like basically kind of be between Limerick and Dublin. I mean, closer oh, to cool. Limerick than Dublin. Um, but but uh, kind of beside this lake and our, our internet connection came by satellite because, you know, they couldn't run a, a phone line that was reliable enough to, to, you know, be a conduit for internet. And so it was really pretty remote, right? But sort of a lot of the experience of growing up uh, was uh, sort of trying to get access to things that like we knew existed, uh, <laughs> but, you know, because we're in the middle of nowhere in Ireland, um, uh, sort of couldn't for whatever reason, like they weren't available in Ireland or not in our part of Ireland or whatever. Um, and, um, and so then kind of when we started Stripe, you know, it was first, first available to businesses in the US um, but that was actually kind of painful to us, right? Because the vast majority of internet users are not in the US. The vast majority of aspiring entrepreneurs are not in the US. And again, coming back to kind of your Typeform example, um, like it should be possible to build that company you know, anywhere where there exists an internet connection, right? Um, and the fact that kind of we understood that, kind of g g given our background, but sort of we're kind of committing the errors that we'd kind of gotten you know, annoyed at other companies for, for, uh, for committing, uh, you know, Kind of d during our childhood, um, th that was sort of unpleasant, right? As like here we are making the same mistakes, um, and then we, we, we just we, we we heard from so many entrepreneurs who sort of wanted Stripe to come to their countries, and we we ourselves knew of many entrepreneurs who'd gone to immense lengths to sort of circumvent these barriers to overcome the, the, the hurdles placed in their way. We knew people who'd done things like, you know, got, gotten the money together, had like flown to the US, had like convinced some bank to allow them to open an account, even though they were, you know, not from the right place, um, who'd incorporated companies in Delaware and like had, you know, been reading all these legal guides to sort of try to understand what the implications of that even were and sort of could they pay themselves back in the home country but have this entity over there. And anyways, so we, we sort of had this personal sense that this was a big problem. And then just like in the Stripe data, we saw that there were so many people who were going to such lengths to, to, to kind of surmount these, these stupid barriers uh, that, were, that were placed in their way. And then when you think about it, um, uh, what, what an entrepreneur, uh, I mean, really anywhere in the world wants is to have access to first class infrastructure, right? Uh, and, and, you know, they're not kind of, you know, you just want to use, to be able to use kind of the same things that, that you know, the best companies get to use, you know, however you define best, right? And, and, and today, the vast majority of the most successful technology companies, you know, they're Delaware corporations and they have a U.S. bank account and, and you know, there's just like a, a standard pattern, right? And, and of course, as with any pattern, you know, there are exceptions to it. Things look different in different parts of the world, but just like that's kind of the standard archetype, you know, circa, you know, 2017 for, for uh, the most successful companies. Um, and so kind of the thinking for us was like, how do we make that standard archetype available to as many entrepreneurs as possible. And when you really, when you look into the details, what you find is that, well, actually, you don't need to be a U.S. citizen or a U.S. visa holder or a U.S. resident to be the owner of a Delaware corporation. Um, it, it, you know, many, many people in the world are, are sort of the owners of Delaware corporations without uh, uh, being U.S. residents. And if you kind of follow through on kind of all the requirements and you really drill into them and you're kind of rigorous about it, what you find is that actually you can provide the standard package, the stuff that the, the best companies here in the Bay Area have access to, you can provide that to entrepreneurs basically anywhere in the world. Uh, ah. and, so, and so Atlas was our effort to do that. And so kind of coming back to what we discussed earlier on, the way we work with entrepreneurs in 124 countries is through Atlas, we've put together this package of we'll incorporate a company, company in Delaware, we'll get you a bank account with Silicon Valley Bank, which is you know, the top bank used, as I'm sure you know, yep. uh, by, by sort of bare companies, <coughs> bare software companies. Um, uh, we'll get sort of you know, the, the basic uh, uh, tax and legal advice to just kind of get you off the ground, get, the, get something kind of uh, uh, foundational in place, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get you access to a US Stripe account. So you can just go and you can start charging your customers anywhere in the world. And so we launched as an experiment uh, in the sense that you know, we, 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 we had many reasons to believe that this could be useful to a lot of people, but obviously we had no data. This is kind of a new market, right? No one else was serving the entrepreneurs uh, in, in It's like in, a startup in, in a box. Yeah, sort of. Um, yeah. And, uh, and or like, a corporate entity in a box. Right, right. Yeah. And, and, and we, we believe that there were sort of an enormous number of entrepreneurs in these dis distant markets or kind of underserved places and so on who 
are, are just as capable um, as entrepreneurs uh, uh, here in the US, but just for stupid structural reasons were being impeded. But you know, that was a hypothesis. Uh, and basically what we found over the kind of year post-launch uh, is that actually there are in fact thousands of these people and they are in fact just as capable. And you know, the, the early traction of the course of the year has been really encouraging. Uh, and so you know, we, we launched a new version of Atlas yesterday. Um, uh, Patrick McKenzie, Patty Olevin is, is doing an AMA on Product Hunt you know, right now basically. Awesome, um, uh, full but, court press. Uh, exactly, um, uh, th this is now you know, a significant area of focus for us. What does it cost? Uh, $500 once off. And so- That's it. That's it. If you were going to do Anywhere that through a law firm and everything else, it'd probably be 5000 That's probably right. You don't make any money on that. You break even, maybe. But you get a customer. Uh, so, so, so Stripe's goal is to increase the GDP of the internet, right? right. Uh, we just want the internet economy overall to be bigger. Um, and you know, there's, there's lots of ways we can do that. We can sort of support more business models. We can help our customers address larger markets by helping them sort of expand internationally. Uh, we can just generally kind of try to provide them with sort of analytics, advice, help, whatever, that, that help them be more successful. But another really good way of doing it is to just have more companies exist, right? right. And so Atlas is our way to sort of try, try, try but there's to- not, you know, That's such a cheap price. I don't think there's much margin in there for you. You have to get them to actually, you'll, you'll make money on them later, is exactly. what I'm saying. No, 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 the, 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 uh, absolutely. The, 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 we, you may we, even we, lose we, money on that. It, it, like it, 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 it's not the focus for us. And I'm not trying ah. to be evasive here, but no, yeah. you're, you're right. We're, we're of course making you know basically nothing on, on $500 once off because yeah. we're covering your Delaware filing fees and right. you know, all the initial stuff that comes up. So no, this is this is really not. Just we're, we're, you, we're not trying to make money on it. The way we make money is Stripe's whole business model is we make money when our customers generate revenue. Right. Um, and so you know the Atlas companies that go on to to be extremely successful the, the, when they're generating revenue, then there's kind of revenue to be sought. But like it just it seems like a crap happy business to, to try to extract revenue from the companies that you know, basically don't have any themselves. On, yeah, exactly. Day zero is not the time to the time. monetize them. Okay, let's play the video. After the revolution here in Egypt, no one was buying anything and it really hurt retail. I saw a great opportunity in terms of all of the products that were just sitting on the shelves in these stores and exporting them, giving these boutiques the opportunity to sell yeah. globally. A little bit. Ever since I was pretty young and I was interested in technology, I had to learn almost everything in English. And my community was in Spanish. I started realizing that there was a lot of developers out there that also needed good content in their own language. So we created Platzi to solve this problem. Here in Turkey, recent developments hurt the tourism industry, especially the small mom and pop shops. At Hotel Runner, our typical customers are family-run properties. So we really help them get online, uh, market their property, and actually start selling. Online banking here in Egypt is almost non-existent. It's incredibly frustrating to think that we work on Kotarik day in, day out, but at the end of the day, there are clients that are coming onto the site, they're loving the items that they see, they want to process the payment, uh, but we're not able to accept it. It's impacting the business, it's, it's limiting us. Growing as a global company, there are obvious problems. One of the biggest ones that we face right now is payment. When we first launched at Platzi, we needed to charge people from all over the world who speak Spanish. So you try to think, where should I incorporate? We had to do everything here in the US. I had to claim my tax ID number here in the US, and this means flying to open a bank account. We had to go to several lawyers, several accountants. That's hard, it's complicated. You know, if we can't get paid for the services, we can't really survive. When we heard about Atlas, all three founders went just, yes, this is it. We, we, we're going to solve this problem finally. Atlas is going to make it so much easier to accept payments in dollars and different currencies and not have to relocate elsewhere in order to do that. We're always going to have our Egyptian roots, but it's going to put us on the global stage. It will allow us to access uh, world-class banking and financial system, which really wasn't possible in Turkey. We're going to see a revolution of startups coming to the global market, and Atlas could help them from the beginning. Now, I don't need to leave Egypt. I can stay in Cairo with my family, and I can just focus on growing culture. We have more than 17,000 hotels in 127 countries. We are hoping that it's going to be a billion dollar business in the next three years. But for me, it really is not about money. Well, you shouldn't have to be a Silicon Valley insider to start a global company. It's not just Silicon Valley. It's the Silicon Valley of the world.
incredibly well done. Um, company's done incredibly well. Uh, how do you think about the public markets, just generally? <laughs> Um, uh, we, we're going to hold off for as long as possible from partaking in them, um, uh, in that, uh, so, so ge genuinely, um, uh, the, uh, you know, f from our standpoint, and sort of Atlas, I think, is a good example of this, uh, you know, there, there were, as we think about the idea of growing the GDP of the internet, uh, I mean, there are, there are so many things that, you know, we want to invest in on that front, that are just going to take a long time to come to fruition. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, there are good examples, uh, there are some good examples of companies that, that I think have done a good job of, of sort of maintaining really long-term time horizons while being in the public markets, you know, Amazon being the kind of most famous and prominent example. On the other hand, if you, if you look at kind of Amazon's early history, um, uh, you know, they had an incredibly turbulent time for sort of their, their first couple of years uh, as a public company, and sort of now, 2017, you know, Amazon is up whatever, 50% so year over yeah. year. It, it, exactly, it, it all looks great, but sort of, they really had a tough time in the beginning. And so I, I, I think there's, and, you know, this is a broader kind of structural challenge um, uh, you know, across the industry, but I, I, I think being a public company certainly does not stop you from taking a really long-term time horizon, but it does make it more difficult. And so, Much more difficult. And you yeah. have all your employees looking at a stock price every day, which Bill Gurley said, there, when he was an analyst, he was, uh, wrote a paper to try to get the employees to stop, Amazon's employees specifically, to stop looking at the stock price and focus yep, on work. Yep, and I'm sure that worked you know, just as well as you might think. But, um, <laughs> uh, but um, you know, fr fr from our standpoint, you know, we, 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 I think being a public company kind of makes sense when, when you've reached sort of, you know, some, some kind of, some point of, sort of some point of stability, some plateau of, you know, you, you've done the stuff that you at least initially set out to. And we feel like we haven't. We're, we're, we're still very early into sort of this tra trajectory that we first established. And just because we work with startups and technology companies, you know, they themselves have lengthy trajectories. And so, you know, this is just going to have to be, when you're building infrastructure, you know, th th there's just long time horizons involved. Uh, slightly technical founder question, but how do you then think about liquidity for early employees, secondary sales? Do you try to run that like a process, like... Uh, I understand Elon does at SpaceX. Do you believe in it? How do you manage that window of keeping people invested? Because now you're in year seven, eight, you nine, know, ten. I, I, I think this is a, a big question across the industry of like, what are the points between being sort of, you know, fully private with sort of no access to liquidity and, and, and kind of no, you know, trading in the stock to, I mean, obviously, you know, fully public and so on, right? And I think that sort of, I mean, obviously that there's, um, that, Part of what makes this challenging is like there are so many constituencies here, right? And kind of not just the constituencies, constituencies here in Silicon Valley, uh, but also uh, you know the the well, various regulators, you know most notably the SEC and so on, right? And um, part of what I've been encouraged by is sort of you know I've talked to kind of multiple people involved, including people who've spent sort of a very long time analyzing this uh, and sort of really digging into the regulatory details. I think for the first time there seems to be kind of a real appetite in many places to figure out a better model because ultimately. Like, to the extent that the public markets do make it harder to take a really long-term time horizon around innovation, that, 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 that's bad for the country overall, right? right? It's, in fact, even bad for investors long-term, sure. right? Because um, they can't reinvest. They can't get liquidity. It, they can't hire more people. They can't be more audacious it, with the next set of companies. It, it, exactly. Uh, and so, you know, I don't presume to know how this is going to evolve. I mean, it's still very early days with the new administration and so on. But my hope, I guess, is that some new models come into existence that enable companies to sort of, on the one hand, start to sort of, uh, uh, sort of broaden their investor base and provide liquidity to, to, to insiders or to early investors who, who you know, don't want to be late stage investors um, uh, uh, and start to kind of thread this needle. All right, on that note, uh, let's hear it for Patrick from Thank Stripe. You. Well done, good job. Thank you.